Well, hello everyone, and thank you for coming to our webinar today on maintaining your value with your customers in this work from home environment created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Showing your customers the value you bring to the uh, relationship isn't exactly a new concept for our industry. It's something we've always had to be mindful of because of how much work and support we provide remotely. Uh, but if it was difficult before, it's even more difficult now that they don't see you, you know, as much or even less than they used to. So today we're going to remind you of a few things and bring up uh, some new ideas as well on what you can do to show your customers how important your service is to their daily operations. My name is Eris Demosthenes. I'll be your host today. I'm the training content manager at SolarWinds MSP. And before I get to introducing our presenter, of course, the obligatory housekeeping slide needs to be brought up. Uh, yes, you're all on mute. That does not mean we don't want to hear from you. Uh, you please use the question panel in the WebEx uh, panel on the right-hand side there um, for all questions. You can start asking them immediately if you wish, um, and we will get to them. Uh, please use that rather than the chat window, as we do not get a record of what happened in the chat window after the fact. Usually, we only get to see what's going on in the question panel. So if there are questions we don't get to, we would like to respond and so please put them in in the chat in the question panel rather than the chat window now and of course let us know if you have any audio or visual video issues of course and we'll try to help you out there um, a lot of times switching over to the phone uh, will help on the audio side at least with that i'd like to introduce you to colin knox our presenter for the day, he's our head of community engagement here at SolarWinds MSP. Colin has been in the industry for a very long time and was a founder and owner of another MSP um, here in Canada, in Alberta, and then the founder and CEO of a company you may have heard of called PassPortal, which uh, has become part of the SolarWinds family now as well. Uh, Colin brings a lot of experience in the industry with him, so uh, we're looking forward to hear what he has to say. And now, before I pass it over to him, I just want to say that he has sort of three areas that he'd like to hone in on today from a topic perspective. Uh, perspective. Um, and that, um, and, and so let's start with the first one being, you know, methods of communicating to your clients. Yeah, Colin? absolutely. Thank, thank you, Eris. Pleasure to be here. So like Eris said, we've got kind of three chapters or three areas that we're going to hit on of, of how you can really focus and, and communicate and maintain an understanding and perception of value that you guys are delivering to your customers. And the first of those is multi-channel communication. Uh, so, so what do we mean by that? It's kind of taking a, a look at the various types of communication channels we can use, methods, and, 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 and really just types of communication. So the first one that we'll end up covering is owner-to-owner -owner conversations. And this is a, a phrase or a term that we've used on a number of webinars. You've probably heard about this before uh, when it comes to a service industry, service business. So we'll delve into a little bit of those, what they mean, how to approach those and what to do with them. Uh, the next is customer experience or customer satisfaction surveys and polls and how you can leverage that as another channel of communicating with your clients and staying top of mind. And then the third one that we'll cover in this section uh, is uh, education on security and productivity tools and how you can use education as a communication method uh, and channel to, again, stay present and, and keep that awareness with your customers on a regular basis. So first of these buckets, owner-to-owner -owner conversations. The, the thing and the, the, the concept that you need to establish is that the underlying tone and message of all this is to be one of empathy because you are also business owners, you are also managers and leaders of small businesses. And, and to convey this message of partnership and explaining that you are there to help. Uh, you are there to help them, you are a partner, you are here in good times and in bad with them and showing and, and really emphasizing that understanding for the situation uh, that you have, uh, which they are also going through. Once you've started to assert and, and kind of set that tone, the most important thing you can do is take time to listen. Let them talk. Listen and understand what their struggles and their needs are because their struggles and needs are most likely going to be different from yours and going to be different from the rest of your customers. Uh, because whether they're in a different industry, they have a different delivery model or business model, 
whether they play into different geographies, all of these types of things make them unique. And so taking the time to listen to what their specific struggles and needs are will help you frame the rest of your conversation and help you frame and understand how you can best help them and be a true and solid partner for them. Once you've taken that time to understand them, try to translate that and understanding of what those needs and struggles are into what you've already done to help them so far, uh, especially through this current uh, environment and situation that we're going through. Helping them understand what you've done is very important for them to recognizing the value. They are so busy right now that they're not sitting there focused and looking and saying to themselves, gee, my computers are just working really good. I'm so glad how quick we were able to move to work from home. They still saw it as a little bit of an inconvenience and they're so focused on doing what they're doing that you do need to let them know what you went through and what you've done to help them, whether that's the project of moving them to work from home, whether that was a fast track cloud migration project that you pulled off, whether that was extending your service hours and reshifting your employees around on their schedules so that you had more accessibility for tech support when people are working their own modified hours because they're also taking care of children at home. So sharing that, don't assume that they know and understand and have recognized what was done. Then you can take a chance to discuss what you are currently doing for them and ensure that it is in alignment with their needs. If you had a plan to do something and you hear them as they're talking and they're not highlighting on those key things as a struggle or a need right now, maybe realign and figure out what else could be done to help them. It could be a completely different scenario that's very easy for you to do or something you're actually already doing uh, and, just, and just frame it to them that way. They need to know that you are always focused on them, that you're always doing things in the background for them, and that this isn't just somebody sitting there waiting for me as a customer to call you and ask for help, that you're there proactively supporting and managing and helping me as a partner. And then the last thing is to instill confidence. Give them that confidence that not only are you their partner and that you're doing all these things, but that you're the right partner to help them through this difficult period. That you understand their business, that, that you've come up with challenges, that you've overcome them, that you've helped them overcome those challenges, and that you are poised and set to continue supporting them and ushering them through this difficult period in any way you can through the use of technology. And it's just establishing, establishing that relationship, establishing that owner-to-owner -owner connection, and, and almost just personalizing it to them so that they feel understood, they feel heard, they feel supported, and uh, that really helps to drive that message of value to them and helps you stay relevant and, and front of mind. The next part of this one, like we said, is the customer experience surveys and polls. These are so easy to do, and the number one thing about it is that it gets attention. People like being asked how things were. They like to, to have their feedback requested and warranted. And more than anything, they like to have it valued. So it's a quick way to get attention. Um, it, it more than anything puts emphasis on their experience and their expectations. It shows that you care how they feel and, and how they are doing in their business and how you, you're actually asking for feedback on how you can improve to make their lives better and make them better. Um, so it's taking that emphasis off of you, even though you're getting the attention and putting it on them to show that you are focused on them and their best outcomes are the only core focus for you. The best thing about these is that they're not time consuming. You know, these can take a matter of two or three minutes to fill out, or in, and in some cases, even a matter of seconds, and that's all you needed to get for them to remember that you're in the background doing things for them. And some examples of some of these quick things are a quick poll or a quick answer, you know, what do you need from IT? A quick question about how was the transition to work from home? And finally, since you know that they're in work from home, in what ways could we improve your work from home experience with IT, right? Taking to heart what their situation is, how they're feeling, how they're doing, and putting the emphasis on them uh, so that you can drive better value for them and they would recognize that and they respect that. So surveys and polls is something that's just, it's a great way to be able to get their attention, deliver deliver value, deliver, uh, you know, um, um, respect and focus and, and all the things that people need to start to, to either maintain or, or earn that trust. 
uh, with you. The next one was a little bit of, a, of an offshoot, but it's an interesting way for you to, to be in front of them. You know, we're in, in a climate right now where uh, hard sales, hard pitch marketing is not well received. And so ways that you can stay focused and show that you deliver value and show, um, you know, kind of keep attention is through quick education bits. And, and by giving some education, it comes actually across as being helpful and selfless. This isn't a targeted pitch. This isn't something where, you know, as an MSP, you're trying to sell a targeted solution to them, but rather that you're just trying to help them be better with what they have and with who they are. Um, so very good opportunity here. And some examples of what you could go through is, you know, providing quick education or even just background and explanations of what VPNs and multi-factor authentication technology are. You know, help explain some of the benefits and consequences to those, why they're using them to secure themselves and how it's especially important to them right now. You know, helping them to understand some of the technology that they're using gives them a greater appreciation for you when they understand what the situation would be if they weren't using those technologies or you hadn't implemented those for them. Providing constant advice and counsel on things like best practices, right? Whether that's password management or anything else in their business, giving them some suggested best practices, whether it's a quick blog article, a video blog that you can send out, part of a newsletter, what have you, it's ways to send these things through various channels and, and mechanisms to just educate and ongoing be, be, you know, giving advice and guidance and, and uh, in a way, support to make them better, uh, again, at, at what they do. Um, giving, sending out emails, demonstrating phishing examples, especially linked to COVID-19 right now. So a quick email when, when we're seeing all these stimulus payments going out, when we see test results being uh, being sent and delivered to people, you know, responses to government grant funding programs. Right now, there's so many email phishing and smishing attacks that are coming through SMS that it's easy to, again, just say, hey, everybody, just a warning, this is what these messages look like. These are the attack vector that people are taking. So be aware, if you see something like this, don't click the link. Don't pay any attention to that. Phone your healthcare provider and ask if your test results are in. You know, check your bank account first, not by clicking their link, but check your bank account to see if money got deposited before you reply back or click a link to say, hey, this is the wrong amount or I didn't wasn't expecting this. So giving them that just helps to show that you're always protecting them and, and taking their best interests at heart. Little things about giving them trips and tricks and tips to uh, using um, collaboration tools like Slack and Teams effectively. A lot of companies did this just super high rush move to work from home. And so maybe they weren't using a collaboration tool before because they had the benefit of just turning around and talking to somebody, helping them out, asking a question, doing whatever. So communicating in a collaboration in a, in a chat channel is new to a lot of these people. So teaching them some of the tips and tricks on how to do tagging, how to coordinate and organize your channels, um, how to put out the best gifts so that you're the funniest person in the company, anything you can offer here to just, again, get that attention, get that focus and shave a few seconds and a few minutes cumulatively off their daily tasks so that they feel that they're being more effective and they can attribute that to advice that you gave them. Um, again, new tools that some may be using with, with uh, you know, web conference tools, whether it's Zoom, WebEx, GoTo. I mean, the proliferation of these tools is outrageous right now. You have a company like Zoom who reported 10 million daily active users at the end of December. Now in April, they're reporting 300 million daily active users. That's insane growth, but that means that a lot of people that were never using these tools before are using them now. And you guys as the experts of knowing how to work with these, how to leverage the Outlook plugins for quick scheduling and sharing of meetings, how to manage the waiting rooms and secure, secure links and access, uh, you know, recording and sharing past recordings with people really helps them be better and really communicates that value um, to, to what they're doing and what their new world is like. And again, being able to connect you with them being successful. The last part of this is again, with everybody working from home, how amazing would it be if you could give some advice to them on maximizing bandwidth for home networks when they have maybe teenagers or kids at home that are streaming videos and music and, and you know, doing online gaming or, you know, who knows whatever else, 
while they're also trying to run a virtual meeting and a web meeting or, or do whatever else that could be consuming bandwidth. So being able to provide some advice there so that they can be more effective at their jobs really drives success for them and really starts to actually show some benefit in the business outcome of, of what you're able to do for their business. Yeah, that's great, Colin. I mean, my favorite of, of the three of definitely is that SMB owner to SMB owner conversation it really brings the the human element uh, back into that uh, relationship. That was a great, great re idea there. Now, let's turn our attention to another topic that goes hand in hand with communication, uh, that being uh, reporting. How can our MSPs leverage reporting to help show their value to their customers? Absolutely. So we do so much reporting as MSPs, right? We're sending out reports all the time and we're consuming data at a ridiculous rate across just this copious amount of metrics. But the key words missing from a lot of the reports we're showing our, our clients are business outcome, right? What do these reports mean and how do those translate to actual outcomes of value and benefits that that client is receiving in their business as a result of the work that you're doing? Right? And that's not just how fast you responded to a ticket or how many tickets you solved or anything. It's what did that do to drive their employee engagement? What did that do to make them more money? What did that do to mitigate their own risk of revenue? Um, so these are things to focus on. So we'll jump in and look at kind of the three buckets and categories that we're looking at when it comes to business outcome reporting. The first is staff confidence and happiness. Engaged and happy employees mean happy customers, means happy shareholders. It's a quote from Simon Sinek, and it's so very true. Employee engagement is huge. So if you can be able to parlay and, and translate reports and metrics and data that you have of the services you're delivering to the engagement and confidence and happiness of their employees, that's a win. The next is how you can maximize staff productivity. Productive staff means more money, means more profit, means they can do more, they can scale, they can be better. Um, so that one's obvious. Again, translating things to how you're making their staff more productive. And finally, how you are mitigating their risk, how you're minimizing risk in their business and risk to customer churn. If you can translate ways of, of the work that you're doing and the metrics that you're carrying and trending towards, showing that it's improving the retention that they have of customers, again, a big win of what you are doing for them, the outcome that you're delivering, which is of huge value to your customers. So we'll jump in on the first one here, staff confidence and happiness. Now, all of these areas for business outcome reporting, we've broken into three, three kind of buckets, I guess. And I keep using the word buckets because I can't think of a better one right now. But so we'll do these, thing, these, these three as a theme across all the different uh, uh, types of business outcomes that we're talking about. First, we'll jump in on ticket reporting. If you show a downward trend over time of submitted issue counts, that shows that the, that the, the employees are having less issues or that they're needing your help less, which can lead to a bunch of things, that they're more confident in the system, that when something goes, goes wrong or something's not working, they have less belief that it's them, that it's the system, or that it's you, and that it's likely something else involved. So that shows that, that they're confident and they're happy. Um, a first call resolution statistic, if you can share that stuff, this is one of those opportunities to show where, hey, staff can be confident when they call us for help that we can solve their issues quickly and easily because this is how often we're doing it on the first call. And that drives trust with those staff and that drives trust with the business. Also showing the number of tickets that are identified and closed without their intervention, right? Being able to show them that a customer or that their employees didn't have to encounter an issue before it was solved also drives to happiness because nobody likes encountering issues. Nobody likes when something doesn't work or, or their computer's broken. Uh, so you can show how you've mitigated that to keep people happy, keep them engaged and believing that they have the right tools for them to do their jobs. Next into security reporting, you can show phishing emails that have been stopped, virus protection that's been updated so that you can get their confidence that you know, you're giving that security blanket, you're keeping them safe. Um, and that the staff aren't having issues. Now, security reporting relates a lot less to the staff confidence, but these still help to, to identify and, and show where you're providing security, where you can make people feel safe overall. The next is on network health reporting, when you can review uptime metrics to show, again, how, how uh, you know, confident the staff can be that things don't go down, 
right? When you're saying, look, it's there, there's not a likelihood that the system's going to go down. They, people aren't kind of waiting with bated breath for something to crash. Um, that really helps with them. If you're able to do a work from home equipment review and inventory, you know, everybody's working from home right now. So many people are working on either old legacy laptops that they had at the office or old legacy computers that they had at home, which aren't overly strong performing computers in most cases. Now, if you're able to do that and share that information with your client, maybe there's an opportunity that they're willing to upgrade some of their staff to a better laptop so that they can be more productive at home. Now, that's a productivity gain for the, for the employer or for the customer of yours. But it's also a better tool and engagement game for the staff because they're getting a faster tool that's going to make them happy and make them more productive and feel better at doing their own jobs. The last way of all to communicate confidence and happiness amongst their staff is giving them a customer satisfaction review. Show the scores that you're getting, those five-star surveys. Show the comments that you're getting that George or John or Jane or Jill have done a great job and that they always solve my problems or they listen to me and they understand me. Share that with them. They're less likely to make a change or do a cut of your service if they feel that their staff like you and are happy with you because they don't want to also upset and disrupt their staff uh, who would then be not confident with an unknown provider or a change in circumstance coming into them. Um, so that's how you can drive staff confidence and happiness and translate to staff confidence and happiness from your reporting. The next is maximizing staff productivity. And this is probably one of the easiest things but a little bit about how you can translate it is really where it comes down to. Um, you know, when you translate and show an average time to response and resolution, obviously that's less time for your, their staff waiting and there's less time for their staff being unable to work. Um, and even if you can show mitigated issues again of, of issues that you've identified and fixed before it became an outage or a disruption to their staff. Now, what you need to do is be able to trend this over time so that you can show improvements over time or even on benchmark industry standards of how long it takes to solve things. Um, to be able to translate that and how many minutes or hours across all their staff you were able to save over the quarter or over the month or whatever term you want to show so that they can report that against their average salary or hourly wages or what the industry and, and kind of national averages are. So you can actually translate that to a productivity dollar amount and save wages and save time of their staff. That's a direct business outcome and benefit to them in doing business with you compared to somebody else that's on an industry standard. The next is really security reporting. And you can drive a lot of productivity here because when there's a security breach or there's a security incident, Almost nobody in that company can work, and for sure the employee that had the incident can't work. So when you're blocking spam, when you're blocking ransomware and crypto variants and other malware uh, by doing things like your system patches and your mail security solutions, showing them that each incident of that saved them the opportunity of that employee going down or their entire business being down and unable to work. And then you can again translate that into maximized and, and recouped and saved productivity and, and mitigated risk. On network health reporting, when you can show device age and future planning, uh, the service availability, things like that, you're now looking at, again, if you have poor performing systems and on the network and, and workstations or laptops that, that are devices that the staff are using, that makes them slower to do their jobs. That holds them up. It encumbers them. Um, you can be able to translate that back to, to faster workers, people being able to get more work done. Uh, being more productive during the day, service availability, that the internet didn't go down and encumber them, email services continued. If they had a file delete or, or you know, a, a restoration request that had to come in and you were able to restore it quickly, you know, it shows the, the value and ability that they've continued to be able to work. Maybe you're able to report on internet bandwidth and make a recommendation to up that bandwidth and translate that to productivity and availability of their staff. Again, staff productivity drives profit, drives revenue, drives the everything behind their business. So when you can translate to minutes or hours gained back and hard dollars that have been protected by your business, that shows an immediate return on investment and kind of a, a, a cost of ownership of, of your service agreement, if you will. So having covered that, we'll, we'll go into the next thing, which is minimizing risk and customer churn. No business can truly grow if they don't retain their customers. And when you have risk, when you have security incidents, it costs customers. There's statistics out there that one security incident in itself of a data breach can immediately cost a business 30% of their revenue. That's massive. 
When you look at the average cost of a data breach and security incident of a small business, the cost to recover is about $50,000 in hard costs. So these are costs that you can translate to when you minimize and mitigate their risks. So you can show issues identified by employees that were taken to heart and recognized and handled, right? Potentially social engineering attacks, any of those types of things. Issues that could have presented a, a, you know, a problem moving forward that you can help with. Again, speech resolution always helps these things because if you don't act fast, you may not be able to close things before you know, they're exploited or, or handled. When it comes to security reporting, this is your best opportunity to, to deliver value and, and business outcome here. When you're using an MFA tool for your, for your uh, customers, being able to show an audit with an emphasis on the denied access, show how many access attempts were thwarted, uh, which were not verified and potentially malicious. That's how many times you save them from being breached. That's how many times you save them from going down. Same thing with an email security report where you've blocked phishing email attempts. Uh, each one of these things where you're driving that shows, an, you know, every single one of them cumulatively adds up to a considerable amount of risk saved. And again, if each, each potential, um, you know, data breach or attack or system outage that you've protected protects them from 30 losing 30% of their customers or protects them from over 50% of businesses not being willing to do business with them in the future, that's a huge gain back for them. Look at things like security awareness training. You can trend the scores from staff. Show how you're driving improvements to their security awareness and aptitude over time and identify and review opportunities to improve so that you can keep driving that up, which keeps mitigating risk, which keeps making them better. You know, with security incidents, it hits so many things. And again, productivity goes up. The employees feel that you're making them better and more educated, so they're happier. Um, you know, looking at things like successful backups with the verified restore. So many tools out there now show screenshot verification. Showing them not only have you backed them up, but that you've tested and proven that you can get them back in the face of disaster is huge. It gains that trust. It shows that you've mitigated that risk so that if something happens, they are going to be okay and going to be able to continue operations. The last one again being network health reporting, show the patch updates, show the potential vulnerabilities and consequences with not having applied those patches, show traffic analysis again of people that have been blocked and intrusion prevention, being able to share this information with them but translating it through to miss risk that's been mitigated or any other business outcome is so key of importance to really demonstrating, maintaining, and communicating value to them in a way that makes sense and, and is understood and really just respected and appreciated by their business. Great, Colin. And if you guys um, are wondering how to run any of these reports, please talk to your account manager, get in front of a sales engineer. They'll, they'll, they'll walk you through some of that. The last topic we wanted to cover today is how to approach your customer business reviews. Those things that we've traditionally called, you know, virtual CIO visits or QBRs or MBRs for quarterly business reviews or monthly business reviews. But before I do, if you don't mind, Colin, just want to launch a quick poll here to ask everybody, have you started doing virtual quarterly business reviews with your customers yet? Mm -hmm. uh, very, say very interesting thing. I mean, there's there's a lot of people who do their QBRs. There's a lot of people who want to do QBRs but struggle with them and just, just can't seem to get them off. And then there's those that have done them regularly but just don't understand or, or haven't really figured out, kind of cracked that nut on how to run these virtually and drive the best value in them. Yeah, well, and if, if that's the answer, then hopefully what you're going to tell us after that will uh, will help give us a little light on this subject here. Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to watch at real time right now because uh, not often do we have multiple sessions of a webinar where the polls come in very similar. It's generally a different different type of group and you have some waiver in, in what's important or what's being experienced by others. But, you know, looking at this one again, looks like there's a lot of people that are planning to do these uh, virtual QBRs, but they're just having trouble just really deciding how to run them. Well, that that plays perfectly into what you're doing, what you're about to tell us, I guess. So let me let you uh, have the floor again here. I'll hide that slide and yeah. and off it's you almost go. Almost like we planned this. Almost <laughs> like we planned. This. <laughs> can't you can't you can't pre-do a poll though. So that's true. Um, yeah. So we'll we'll jump into QBR. So I, if you don't know or you didn't hear at the beginning, I ran a fast growth MSP. I did that for five years, grew it to four million in revenue, and one of the 
key things that I would attribute to our success was staying front of mind and top of mind and running good frequent QBRs on a consistent basis. So whether you're running them virtually, whether you, you know, when the world gets back to uh, its new normal and you're able to do these face-to-face, a lot of this recommendation will apply. The one big recommendation when it comes to doing it virtually, have your reports ready, do them over a virtual conference or web conference platform where you can share your webcam, where you can have the next best thing to a face-to-face communication and preload the reports into it so that it's not just straight presentation, but they can also download and have the takeaway, the take home of this presentation as well. Um, so it, it really just helps for them to have the handouts, for them to be able to see you, you to be able to see them so that you can also adapt in how you're talking and, and stuff based on reactions that you're getting. And it also forces to get that, that continued focus and attention from them. If it's just a slide share, you can't really guarantee that they're watching. They could still be checking emails, typing in the background, whatever, uh, but doing this type of stuff and, and really warranting that time. Now, one of the key things to any QBR and the first component and first section of any QBR that I would recommend you run is focused on value demonstration, which is very fitting for the topic of today's presentation, but it's so keenly important. And you know, over the years, I've talked to hundreds and actually thousands of MSPs uh, about things and driving value and improving value for customers. And when I talk about QBR, so often people come back and say, I tried running these, I've done a few, but my customers don't come back to them. When I try to book them, they say that they're not gonna come back or they don't have time or whatever. And as hard as it is to be straightforward and give these people straight advice, the message that I give back is chances are they came to one, but they didn't see value in attending it. With any meeting, with any session that you do for your customers, there needs to be value in it for them. It can't just be a show. It can't just be you you know, talking about you or giving a bunch of metrics that don't mean anything to them. They have to be able to leave that meeting feeling that they are better and more informed than they were going into it. Um, and so that's kind of the key to it and, and being able to structure your QBR and deliver your QBR in a way that they feel happy and rewarded for actually attending it. So value demonstration is the first component to every QBR. The next component is an open discussion, being able to have some critical and sometimes very mm, difficult conversations with your clients. And, and conversation and discussion is a key word there. It's a two-way dialogue. It's not just a single one-way presentation. And then the last part is strategic planning. And this is really that, that golden nugget. This is what makes people feel happy for attending, right? First is that they know all the good things that have been done. They were able to participate in a conversation. And the last part is they're leaving with something in hand of what's next. So we'll jump into the first bucket here, value demonstration. First way to do that is share what has been done over the past quarter. What have you done for them? Uh, you know, it's that common old adage of, I know you've done a lot, but what have you done for me lately? This is why you do these things quarterly. So you can tell them every single quarter all the good things that have been done for them, what you've worked on, what tasks you've performed, how you've been sure to keep them running, uh, everything that's gone on. It's also an opportunity to show them where you've shone. Uh, you know, discussing challenges that were encountered and how you overcame them, that you didn't let roadblocks become an excuse to encumber and hold back their business. Again, talking business outcomes, this shows that it's not about finger pointing, it's about getting the job done and empowering them to be a better business at what they do. Um, They don't want to have roadblocks, they don't want to have excuses, so this gets away from those excuses and just shows what was encountered and what was done, right? Gee, I don't know, maybe in the last quarter, we've had this massive pandemic happen and we had to overcome that. How did we do that? We did cloud migration projects or to virtual uh, desktop infrastructures. Maybe it was just a move to remote work from home and implementation of remote tools and security tools. Um, You know, showing that stuff really helps and resonates with them. The next is kind of tying in the last section that we talked about, those business outcome reports. This is where you deliver the business outcome reports. You take the time, you review the statistics, the metrics, the trends, and you translate that into the business outcomes. Mr. or Mrs. Client, this is how much time we saved your staff in minutes or hours over the last quarter. Based on a national salary average or hourly wage average, it's this many dollars in staff productivity we saved you. 
this many security incidents were avoided and mitigated because of controls and tools that we've put in place for you. That means we've saved you $50,000 in recovery costs this many times. This means that we saved and, and, and protected 30% of your revenue this many times. That conversation never gets old and it just highlights and pops their eyes out to recognize what you have done for them and how you've impacted and driven value for their business. The next is to dig a little bit deeper into those reports. You know, the ones that we love, but really their eyes gloss over all the time, but still, it's not about them understanding the metrics. It's about them seeing the charts and being able to assess the trends that you're discovering and uncovering, whether that's about the data growth rates that they're doing, system util utilization ratios, licensing thresholds that they're on a, on a path to, to hitting or exceeding, frequent users from issues that they're having, utilization of the system by certain users, times, all that sort of stuff. So you can show how closely and keenly you're watching their system to avoid and mitigate risks in the future and be able to know what's really happening with the way that their IT system is working. And once you cover that, it really, it, it flows nicely into the next session, which is doing and having and engaging in an open discussion. Now, we don't want to jump the gun and just jump right into all these trends that we've just uncovered and all the good that we've done. The next part after showing all the value we've done is being able to, to become a bit vulnerable with your client, opening up to them and sharing with them and talking with them uh, in a matter that, that they respect because it shows that you trust them, that you can trust them with potentially confidential information about your business, which then begins to earn their trust. So when I talk about sharing your plans for the upcoming three to six months, it's things about what are your hiring plans? What are your expansion plans? Are you going through M&A? Are you looking at moving to a bigger office, opening a new location, expanding geographic regions that you can now support them in, new offerings that may be coming, you know, garnering their feedback on these new uh, offerings, being able to translate a new location or new geography that you're gonna work in can translate to maybe they were thinking of opening in that, or maybe they were looking at buying a company there but weren't sure about how IT support would work. These are all things that you can share with them. And then in a reciprocal manner, when you've shared those and you've kind of opened up first, the next part is to have and inquire to them about the plans for their business over the same period, right? What hiring plans do they have? Do they have expansion plans, new offerings or products? Are they moving? Are they going to acquire a company? What's happening with them? This really is key and helps you mitigate and avoid some of those issues where they call and say, hey, we had three new employees start today and we need computers and everything else set up for them. Or, oh yeah, we're moving offices next week. Can you make sure internet's moved over and come work on the weekend to, to move all of our computers? It allows you to, to establish yourself and be prepared to be a partner with them and not just a supplier, not just a vendor, but somebody that's truly in a cooperative and, and uh, supportive business relationship. The next is to provide honest feedback to them as a customer. Now this can be one of those uncomfortable and critical conversations that you have, but if you're having issues with them or some of their team members or certain things about their technology that have been avoided or, or not rectified, if you don't give that feedback, it's never going to be solved. You can't shove something under the rug and expect it to go away. You need to have open and honest conversations with them and provide feedback to them as a customer, how they actually are, what challenges you might be having with them as an organization, whether it's how fast they pay their bills. Maybe it's a challenging employee that they have. Maybe it's a solution or part of their technology stack that's just not working for them and it's costing you a lot of time and effort to solve it on a flat rate contract. This is where you can start to have those conversations and find ways to remediate that and be able to come to a, a you know a, a little bit of bumpy road, but at the end come out with a polished rock together. And then again on the other side, once you've provided that feedback to them, don't just leave it there, but then solicit honest feedback on you, right? A lot of times we've we've talked to people and they say, well, my my customers they they worry too much about my feelings and you know I don't feel that they're being honest. They say that things are really great, but at the same time I'm not sure that they are. Well, one way to get honest feedback is to give them honest feedback first. If you tell them something that's maybe not the best about their business and interacting with them, they will be sure to reciprocate that to you. And some of that honest feedback is the best feedback you can get. Um, you know, Bill Gates has said before that uh, your greatest source of learning is your most unhappy clients. Now they don't need to be the most unhappy, but when you get that feedback, don't dismiss it. 
take it to heart, consider it, and act on it. Um, and that's going to be things that drive trust. That's also going to be things that forge a stronger relationship and that actually help to deliver a better experience and, and really uh, a perception of greater value that you're delivering to them. So that's kind of all about having an open discussion. Now, we talked before about what's that golden nugget that they can take away, what's going to make them happy for attending, and that's a strategic plan. They all like being able to look forward to the future and understand what's going to happen, what's the plan of action. So the first thing that you can do here is present your current plan. Take a look, show what the current plan is, review it again with them, and discuss whether it's still the best plan of action, right? Did the information that they shared with you in that open dialogue and open discussion maybe present a challenge to this plan and, and need some adaptation or modification or maybe a complete rework? This is where you work with them and come out and come to an agreement on what the best plan is moving forward uh, based on the, 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 their own projections and plans of what's happening with their business. The next is you've already presented on existing challenges. You've, uh, uh, you know, things that you've overcome. You've talked about challenges that you have today. This is where you propose solutions to those challenges. This is how, this is a challenge you have. This is what a consequence of it. You already had the discussion. Now building this into the strategic plan, this is how we propose to solve that. Can we get your go ahead on this and look to move forward? So key thing, they can feel resolution uh, when they leave this, this uh, meeting started and they've they've been presented with challenges, they had some worry, but now they can feel peace at peace and just rest assured that there is a plan to solve those things. So it's kind of like a really Oreo cookie. You start with some good news, cover in a little bit of bad news, but you wrap it up with a good feeling at the end again. The next is you, you had those trends, you discussed trends, you reviewed it with them. Now it's about identifying the potential challenges that those trends may show or things that could arise based on the trends. Uh, and then presenting options to mitigate. These aren't necessarily things that you need to act on in the upcoming quarter, but builds part of that plan and strategic plan for what we need to consider maybe six to nine months out as well. Um, so it shows that you're forward thinking, drives value and shows again where you're mitigating risk for their business on an ongoing basis. Finally with it, it's about reviewing all of the items from the open discussion and looking to see what can be done proactively to make sure that what your plan is is 100% in alignment with that customer's business plans. Making sure that there's nothing falling out of alignment there, that things have changed, changed, things have shifted, and something is no longer relevant, or not that it's not relevant, but it's not the right solution based on new information that you have. So this is really where you can come together, come up with a strategic plan, be in agreement with it, it's in alignment with their plans, and then you can go forward and accomplish all of those things to come back in your next QBR and cover them again as, as some of the wins that you had and what you've done for them. Yeah, that's great, Colin. And now we don't have a ton of questions uh, right now for um, for you. If, if you guys have any questions, we've got a few more minutes that we're willing to, to answer them. So please put them in the question panel. In the meantime, I'm going to just launch uh, the obligatory how did we do poll. <laughs> this is and... the driving value. If we didn't drive value for this for you in this session, you may not attend other webinars for us. So they really hoping come... that this was very valuable for you. That's right. Um, and somebody's just asking what QBR stands for. So uh, quickly, that's just quarterly business review. You may see MBR as well for monthly business review. A lot of times in the industry, we've been calling it, a, you know, like a, a CIO visit or meeting. Um, so that's that's all we're talking about here. All the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and I will end that poll. Oh, there's more questions coming in. That's great. Um, okay. So we're not, uh, the next question is basically, can we, you know, it would have been nice to show them how to run those reports, for example, in the tool. So guys, we are not, you do not want any technical advice from either of us in regards to Incentral <laughs> or RMM. Um, please reach out to your account manager, uh, or if you already know your, who your sales engineer is att attached to your account or what have you, call your, call your account manager, get them to book a meeting for you. They will happily show you how to run any of the reports we talked about today, okay? Um, so with that, I will close this poll. Um, I will say thank you to everybody on the line. Um, yes, account managers don't answer the questions themselves. They can set up time for you with a sales engineer. 
um, as I was saying again. So contact the account manager, get them to set up a time with a sales engineer, uh, somebody who's more technical than them as well, and they will walk you through all of the report processes that you're looking for in your particular uh, solution, whether it's RMM or in Central. Okay, guys? All right, so with that, I'll say thank you for your time today. We'll let you guys go. Um, have a great one. Please stay happy, healthy, and safe um, in, in this time. And we'll look forward to seeing you again. We've got another webinar next week. For those of you um, who want to see some past information in regards to this subject being you know, COVID-19 and everything that we've done, we have a resource center set up. I've posted the link in the chat window uh, so that you guys can go and grab that right now. I'll leave that open right now while, while I'm saying goodbye. Um, we have lots of webinars, videos, uh, documents, etc., that you guys can uh, leverage um, in this time. Um, all, of course, free of charge, um, just there for you to, to help you, okay? So, again, thank you all for joining us today and look forward to seeing you again next time. Cheers. <music>